Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode. So today I wanted to try something a little new here on the channel. If you can call it new because my channel doesn't really have any consistency to it anyway, so yeah, something new. Um, so I was chatting with someone on Instagram a while ago about how exactly I decided between the two master's programs I'd been accepted into. And uh, this led me on to thinking about doing a video on how I decided on the master's programs I applied to and then the master's program I ended up choosing. Uh, a day after this, exactly a day after this, I got a message from my good friend Zan saying, wouldn't it be a great idea if you did a video on how to apply to master's programs? Specifically like the time frame it takes, when you should start, the things you need in order to apply, things like that. They were not aware that I had been thinking about doing this other video. So I decided that this video here, how to apply to a master's program, would make for a great part one to my part two video how to decide between master's programs. So make sure you are subscribed and you turn on notifications so that you know when that video comes out. So without any further ado, let's get into today's video. Let's get into how to apply to a master's program. So I just wanna start off this video by saying that my experiences are solely based on applying in Ireland and in the UK. Uh, if you're American or Canadian, your application process seems very complicated and I am praying for you all. <laughs> if you're anywhere else in the world, I don't exactly know if these steps would be applicable to you. Um, maybe in some other European countries it might be similar, maybe not. I don't know, I apologize. For anyone wondering why I'm qualified to discuss how to apply to master's programs, um, I'm not. <laughs> but if you would like me to spout qualifications, uh, I have an undergraduate BA, uh, International, Bachelor of Arts International, in Archaeology and Classical Studies, and I am currently undertaking my Master's of Science in Human Osteology and Paleopathology at the University of Bradford. I have to say all these things with like, fancy undertones because I have imposter syndrome. <laughs> so the first thing you really need to start considering long before you're looking into master's programs specifically, just in general, you need to consider when doing your bachelor's degree is your grades. I know that this seems sort of like Obviously, I need to consider my grades, but I don't just mean that you're getting decent grades, you're getting okay grades. I mean, you need to consider your GPA and you need to consider your honors class or honors grouping. So at my university, we had hmm, three or four honors classes. You had a 2.3, a 2.2, .2, a 2.1, and then a 1. Um, most universities in Ireland and the UK, at least in regards to archaeology, classics, arts degrees in general, it might differ for science subjects or more competitive programs, but in general, you are required to have at least a 2.1 honours, which is a second, no, uh, first class honours, second degree, or sec I don't know. I'll, I'll write it here. <laughs> I really should have researched this beforehand. But that is dependent on your GPA. So I ended up graduating with a 3.41, I believe, GPA, which translated into a 2.1 honors, which is what I needed for my master's program. So obviously this is something you need to consider long before you're applying to master's programs because this is something you cannot achieve on the fly. You can't get it in your final year once you realize what program you want to get into. It's too late. I'm sorry. It's too late at that point. Maybe you can try and boost it if you're nearly there, but it is something you need to consider beforehand. Most universities will require you have at least a 2.1 honors. Sorry. 
So, when should you actually start seriously considering applying to master's programs? Uh, I would suggest doing this in your final year of your BA, or your bachelor's, if you want to go straight into a master's program. Obviously, the earlier you start, the more time you've got to research and to uh, write personal statements and all the other stuff we'll get into later. Um, so, you know, judge for yourself, look at maybe your exam or assessment timetable and see when you've got the time. Obviously, the start of the semester will probably be better than the end of the semester, but I would definitely not leave it until the second semester. Start in first semester at some point. Um, because it can be a long process depending on what you're applying to, how many universities offer the course, how many universities you're going to vet, how many applications you're going to submit. Things like that can dictate how long the process is going to take. So I would suggest starting at the beginning of the year. And if you get it out of the way before second semester even begins, great. If not, at least you've got the full ball rolling on the process. Besides a 2.1 honors, what else is required for you to apply to a master's program? First of all, uh, a relevant bachelor's degree is usually required. For example, my archaeology degree was relevant enough for me to apply to my osteology course because it's related to archaeology. It's also related to uh, forensics. I don't know. They let me in. I'm not questioning it. <laughs> What else is required? You need a list of your academic achievements, academic transcripts. Um, for my university, these were easily available online. Um, I just had to go into my university portal and I could download them. I don't know how accessible they are for you, but yeah, you need your academic transcripts, you need two references, and you need a personal statement. Now, because the transcripts in my case were easy enough to get, left those until the end, I started by requesting a reference because this is dependent on who you are emailing and how long it takes for them to get back to you. You can use academic references, you can use work references. I would not recommend using personal references, as in friends and family. That just doesn't look good and it doesn't really make sense. I used two academic references. A friend of mine used one professional and one academic reference. Um, the university you're applying to may specify what kind of reference it needs to be, but in my case they didn't specify. So what you want to do is send out an email to whomever it is that you are requesting the reference from. If you are requesting an academic reference, I would first of all suggest requesting it from a teacher who knows who you are. But better than that, request it from a professor who knows you more than just a face in the class. For example, one of my references was from a professor who had run our work placement module, so she had received feedback from my placements. So she knew how I had performed in those placements. I was also getting A's in her class. So both of these things look good. My second academic reference was from a professor who was in charge of a student committee uh, for an upcoming conference and I was on that student committee so I met up with him and other students on the committee at least once every other month so you know we knew each other more than just a student in the classroom that I occasionally give feedback to so you know if you can find a professor who knows you a little better than just they're one of my students then that would be good so yeah, what you want to do is you email them. So, my email went a little something like this. Dear Professor X, I am currently applying for postgraduate programs and require two academic references for my application. 
I am writing to inquire as to whether you would be willing to act as a referee on my behalf. I have attached my curriculum vitae and a list of programs I am interested in. I would be open to discussing this with you further in person if you wish. I look forward to the rest of your hunter-gatherer lectures. So I felt it was important to add just a little bit of like, oh, I look forward to this, or I really enjoyed the last lecture on this. So what I did was I listed the university that I was applying to. This is helpful so that if these universities pop up in their inboxes, they know what it's about. <laughs> so uh, at the time, I was looking at University of Bradford's Human Osteology and Paleopathology, University of Southampton Archaeology and Bioarchaeology, Durham University Bioarchaeology, University of Edinburgh Osteoarchaeology, and University of Aberdeen Osteoarchaeology. And then I uh, added my CV or my academic CV, I suppose. It didn't have my waitressing jobs on it, basically. But yeah, that's just what I emailed my professors. They got back to me saying, yeah, we'd be more than willing to. And I made sure to thank them for accepting to be my referee. And then I also made sure to email them when I got my acceptance letters saying, I've been accepted. Thank you so much for helping with this process. Yeah. Um, obviously, write your own email if you just copy and paste it. It doesn't really look great. <laughs> So, one of the other things you might want to start working on a little early -er, for your application is your personal statement. This was not my most enjoyable activity, but uh, I got there eventually. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to read you out my personal statement because they are personal. Um, there's loads and loads of resources to help you write a personal statement. Um, I would write, so what I did for my one is I wrote my original personal statement for University of Bradford, whatever. And then what I did was I, um, there was like one paragraph that talked specifically about the university and about the courses within the module that I was interested in. For example, I was like, oh, I'm really interested in your grave concerns and your paleopathology module. Can't wait for those. Um, so that paragraph got changed, obviously, with my personal statement to Durham. I inserted what modules in Durham I was interested in taking, uh, you know, things like that. I kept most of the personal statement the same and just changed those aspects, which made it easier to, you know, use it. Like the, the personal, you don't have to rewrite completely your personal statement. But do add one section at least that is personalized to the university you are applying to. I would also add that it is a great idea, as awkward as it may be, to send your personal statements to your friends, to your family, to peers who are also applying to master's programs, or to peers who are already in master's programs, they don't have to be the same master's programs that you're applying to, uh, just master's programs in general, and just get their feedback, whether it just be grammatical and spelling uh, edits, or whether it be, dude, don't add in the bit of, I have always dreamed of, because they really hate that. You know, it's good to get feedback from as many different sources as you can. Um, yeah, so the references and the personal statement, I would start on those um, while you're still looking at universities. Like I said, there was about a list of, what, five universities there that I emailed my professor saying I was interested in. I only ended up applying to two because I discounted some of the other ones. So I hadn't even finished researching my master's programs yet when I was sending out this email while I was working on my personal statement because I knew that those things would take time. Whereas researching the master's programs and looking into you know, different universities and stuff, yes, that took time, but I wasn't waiting on someone else to respond. I wasn't waiting on my mom to correct my personal statement. Those were things I could do in my own time. Whereas the personal statement and the references were things I had to wait on a third party to get back to me on. So that's why I put those at the top of the list of things I had to get done early. 
And like I said as well, the third thing you need for applying are your academic transcripts. Uh, this obviously depends on your university. You might need to email them to get them. They might be easily available through your university portal. I don't know. Whenever you're applying to a university, there will be a section for adding in your academic transcripts. You add them in there. Um, some universities may require you to um, show a proficiency in English. Mine had a link, like you could add a document to prove proficiency in English. Um, the fact that I went to an English college was enough, so I didn't add in any corroborating evidence that I had a proficiency in English because my university degree was entirely through English. So if I survived three years at UCD, I could survive one year in Bradford. So after you've submitted all of that stuff, you've finished your application, you've sent it off into the unknown internet verse, all you have to do then is wait, which is very irritating <laughs> and very, very stressful. But at least if you've gotten it all done early enough and sent away, you don't have to worry about rushing it while also rushing assignments or study or other everyday life activities. So that's why I suggest starting at the beginning of the year. Um, I think I submitted mine around, I sent that email to my professor around November. I submitted my applications as a whole around early March and I got my provisional acceptances around the end of March. They're actually quite quick at getting back to me, which I appreciate. So your provisional acceptance means that, yay, you've gotten in, provided you graduate with the grades you are expected to graduate with, provided your grades don't dip, provided you don't fall into the lower honours class. Um, so, yay, basically you're in, provided some mass disaster doesn't happen in your life. Um, at this point, you need to decide if you've applied to multiple programs and been accepted to multiple programs, you need to decide which program you want to actually go to. This can be the most stressful bit because at least when you're deciding what universities to apply to, you know, it's not as stressful. You can apply to multiple ones, but you cannot accept multiple placements and it can be very, very stressful. It was for me, I had a panic. I was like, this is my whole life on the line here. What if I pick the wrong university and then I'm applying for jobs next year? And people are like, ooh, you went there? Girl, you made a mistake. It was stressing me out so much, which is why I decided to make a whole YouTube video about it, which will be coming out probably next week, even though I'm recording this video like a month ahead of when it's coming out because I've got way too much like backlog of stuff. <laughs> to go up but um yeah so subscribe for that but um yeah all you have to do then is accept the one you want to accept decline the others make sure you do decline the others and you don't just leave them there with provisional acceptances um and then you have to just wait until you graduate and you get your final grades back um depending on which university you apply to you may need to go back into the application portal and upload your final transcripts for the final year to prove that you graduated with the grades that you were expected to graduate with, at which point they will send out your full acceptance and they'll start the ball rolling on you attending university at the end of summer. If you're not in COVID, I didn't start till January. It was a fun nine month wait between when they cancelled classes and when I started my masters. Um, some universities, I think, judging from what happened with one of my friends who applied to a neuroscience thing in Edinburgh, um, they seem to get your final transcripts from the university, not from you, because she received her full acceptance without having to submit documents so just check that um, when they send you your provisional acceptance they'll send you like a whole document 
stating like how much the tuition fee is, what they expect from you, what you should expect from them. You know, basically like your your contract thing. But part of that will say uh, provisional on completion of or, you know whatever. It'll tell you. It won't directly tell you you need to upload, but it will tell you in a roundabout way that um, you need to upload your final transcripts when you have them. But that's it. That is how to apply to a master's program. It is actually not that stressful. <laughs> Unless you're like in America, in which case you've got to like apply with a whole, you got to know what you want to do your dissertation on already. And you got, it's basically a PhD. You're basically applying for a one year PhD. At least that's what my friends have told me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got to appreciate a simpler process. <laughs> Anyway, I hope this video was helpful to anyone out there who is applying to master's programs or who is just interested in it in general. I know I watch weird videos like these even though they don't apply to me. I mean, this one sort of does. You know what I mean? <laughs> I hope it was helpful and entertaining and coherent and it wasn't too much of a um, bumbling mess. I'm a science student. I don't know how that happened. I dropped out of science at 15. Academia! <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you comment, like, subscribe, do all those analytical things that YouTube loves. And I will see you guys in my next video. If you've got any requests for further academic advice, master's advice, then please be sure to leave them down in the comments below. I'm kind of enjoying these videos and uh, I'll see about making videos about them or just I'll reply to you in the comments if it's a short and easy snappy question. <laughs> Alright, I'll see you guys next week. Bye!